dans les airs. Bonjour. Euh, je suis désolé, mais mon français ne suffit pas pour ce sujet, alors je vais, je vais parler en, en, en anglais. Um, I'd like to start today by telling you a story, a story about privacy, actually. The story is about a hacker. His name is Dreaded Pirate. Okay, and he's most famous for creating a platform which is called Silk Road. If any of you may know it, it was the Amazon, but in an anonymous way. It became most famous for becoming the number one place to deal drugs online, and it eventually got shut down by the FBI. But this story isn't about Silk Road as much as it is about Dreaded Pirate and how he got caught. Okay, it wasn't the FBI that caught Dreaded Pirate. It was a hacker who again went to far lengths to try to hide his identity. It was actually an agent from the IRS, which is the American tax service, by the name of Gary Alford, who lived in New York, who was responsible for identifying the true name and identity of Dreaded Pirate. So how did he go about it? Gary had this trick that he used when investigating companies. He wasn't a programmer, he wasn't a coder, he didn't know anything about hacking. But what he loved to do was Googling. And so he did his usual little trick. He went on Google and he searched for the name of the company before that company became public. So he went on Google, he searched for Silk Road, he set a filter to look for mentions of Silk Road before the company became public, which was before 2011. And he found that there was one user on Reddit by the name of Altoid who actually spoke about Silk Road. They said, have you guys checked out Silk Road? It's this cool anonymous marketplace platform. And so Gary knew that this person, Altoid, must have had insider information about Silk Road. So he decided to look for additional mentions of Altoid online. And he found that Altoid deleted all of his messages except there was one cached, left on Google, under a Reddit thread, a response to another user on Reddit with an email address, rossalbright at gmail.com. Ross Albright, aka Dreaded Pirate, got captured by the FBI a few months later and is now serving time for starting Silk Road. This story to me is really about privacy and about how exposed we as regular people are if a hacker couldn't hide their identity and a simple Google search revealed who they were. Imagine how much information is available about us, regular mortals on the internet. There's another trend, however, happening. If you notice behind me, the combination of words, the privacy paradox. The other trend is not that just users are now sensitive towards their private information being exposed and used online, but they also want their user experience on the internet to be more relevant and better. And that is what the privacy paradox signifies, that users don't want companies to use their data or give out their data. At the same time, they want these companies to use their data. And today, I'd like to unlock how we get out of this privacy paradox and move to a better reality forward. This is me. I hope you like the picture. Um, my background is actually in mathematics. I went to UCLA, and UCLA is the school university in Los Angeles, which is well known for being the founding place of the internet. I was also there at a very cool time. It was a time when one of my math professors, Terence Tao, won the million dollar Netflix algorithm challenge. Okay, so it's the first time that there was big money pouring into commercial uses of artificial intelligence to actually power user experience. And I later went into that field and I started working at Google to optimize Google.com's user experience. I was one of those annoying people that decided how many ads you saw on Google, for example, but Sort of the coolest thing I worked on was actually something called responsive search ads, where we automated copywriting. So we had this idea, what if you could write and show a totally unique ad to every single search that happens on Google? And we went and built a machine that could generate copy without human involvement. 
from a landing page and ideas provided by advertisers, and that had a lot of value for Google. In fact, the type of work that our team was doing and our department delivered huge growth for Alphabet in monetary value. Okay, so every year that we worked on optimizing the user experience for Google, the company would make an extra 6 to 12 percent of revenue. So imagine if that's the number for Google, how much money is probably locked up in user experience outside of Google and the internet at wide. So back to the privacy paradox. I didn't invent this. And users certainly feel this way. 82% of people today claim that they want relevant experiences without sharing additional information about themselves. And they're not the only ones noticing. Governments, as you guys all know, France is on the frontier of GDPR and privacy laws, have also noticed, and they move to protect their users for particular identity theft and trying to connect data from multiple sources, right? And so has the rest of the world. And in the past couple of years, big companies has also, have also moved to do the same thing. Probably most notably, Apple has moved to make the internet more private. And those businesses that didn't move along this consumer trend fast enough were there to take huge losses. Facebook, for example, is estimated to have lost over $10 billion of ad revenue as a result of Apple making this change. But there aren't only just losers in this world of the privacy paradox. There are also clear winners. So let's do a quick thing. How many of you have used TikTok? Put up your hand. Very good. I've deleted it from my phone because I'm trying to spend my time on more useful things. And now I watch it on my girlfriend's phone, so that didn't really help much. But the point is, there are clear winners in this privacy-centric reality, and TikTok is one of them. TikTok has by now surpassed all companies in social media on every single important metric, starting with average watch time per user to total watch time and how much time we spend on the internet, and finally finishing with total ad revenue, which this year they have passed YouTube in total ad revenue. So how did TikTok win, right? It won by a very cool strategy to leverage data to power a hyper-relevant experience in this privacy-centric reality. That cool strategy results in TikTok being able to seamlessly feed the next piece of content to every user really quickly reacting to the smallest pieces of intent, to the smallest pieces of information that the user exhibits by interacting with the app super, super quickly. And the result of that is that almost all the watch time for TikTok comes from these recommendations. TikTok is special, and its algorithm is special, because it leverages a ton of data. We call this data attention data. This attention data, what it signifies is that apart from just clicks and the fact that you watch the video, TikTok actually observes how long you stay on a video. Did you linger on a video? Did you send a message about that video to one of your friends? Did you like the video? Did you share the video? And so forth. You get the point. They literally know everything you do with the previous video. And based on that, they can feed it into a giant neural net and figure out what is the relationship between that previous action that you just took and the best likely video that they should show you. We're not here to just talk about TikTok. We're here because this is a retail conference. And so you might ask, what does this have to do with anything that I do? Well, it has to do a lot with what you do, because this is a gigantic opportunity for retail to follow the path of companies like TikTok in being very creative in utilizing attention data. Think about the amount of different signals that are available to you to actually understand what users are doing on your 
retail sites and apps. Besides someone clicking on a product or purchasing that product, there is plenty of information similar to how TikTok does it, attention data of someone lingering and looking at a product, someone liking a product, someone adding that product to their favorites, adding it to the cart, removing it from the cart, scrolling past it, and so forth. If you could utilize all this information, perhaps you can build a better user experience for your customers. So our team at Datamilk decided to take a stab at this. The designers actually created a prototype store that maybe uses some of this information. So let's take a quick break and look at this cool video that the team made. Could you roll the video, please? Thank you. So I hope that was illustrative, but basically what we saw was on the left side the store that's super reactive to people's behavior and ends up feeding them content that's actually potentially interesting given those little signals that were displayed by the user and the right not. And that made a huge difference in actual purchasing behavior. The store that used attention data actually ended up getting a purchase versus the one that didn't. This slide is something interesting, and I spend a lot of time in particular looking at AI and its impact on other industries. This is a case from industrial design. And the reason that I want to show you guys this, because it's not enough to feed cool data into a model, you also have to use great models to get value out of it. In this particular case, the problem was they wanted to design a node, which is this type of industrial design unit, that's actually more effective than what a human could imagine. And the AI did exactly that. That shape doesn't look like a normal shape that any designer would ever consider should be used. But indeed, it ends up outperforming not only in structural strength, but in cost as well, the human designed one. And that's the era that we live in today. We live in an era where AI models are available to find incredible hidden relationships between large data points, right? And you are in a position where you have a ton of information available provided by your users and actually how your store is used in which these relationships can be discovered to make the user experience even better. And so I invite you to participate in this future together. A future where your users and customers feel safer from using your store while at the same time getting a great and relevant experience. So together, maybe if we just pay more attention to each other, we can build a better reality. Thank you very much. We're going to do questions now, I believe. So. Alors, est-ce que vous avez des questions en français, en anglais On lui, on, on traduira. Hein. Allez, ne laissez pas notre ami londonien tout seul. Première question. Non, on passe directement à la deuxième question. <laughs> C'est toujours plus simple la deuxième question. <laughs> toujours pas. Ah. Maybe you have questions for them. <laughs> Sure. You didn't expect this one. <laughs> uh, who here is from a retail shop? Maybe they're in UX design or they have interaction with designers on the team. Alors, qui c'est qui a des interactions avec les designers ici? 
Nobody, you alone. I'm alone. <laughs> you all alone. I'm alone. <laughs> well, C'était une question. Ah. Wonderful. Alors, on a une question de notre intervenant précédent, Vincent Bernard. Vincent, tu te mets debout. Ça marche. Bon, c'est facile pour moi parce que je me suis déjà chauffé hein, la voix. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, you showed some very interesting numbers. Uh, one of them was about TikTok being uh, number one right now in, time, uh, in terms of uh, uh, time watched. What do you think about the future? Because I can, the, the trend is amazing. What do you think that it will be uh, to remain number one for like four years and now it's over for the other one? Or, well, you know, what do you think about it? That's my question. Very good question. Good question, especially for marketers. I think when you look at social media trends in general, uh, one thing we used to do, we would evaluate the numbers when I was at Google of different age groups using the internet. And this is why Mark, Mark Zuckerberg that is, was really concerned about TikTok. And this is why they made the decision to acquire Instagram very, very on. But you could find these trends in younger populations starting to use social media. And it always happens the same way. The young ones come in, the old ones come in later, and then by the time people of my age come in, the young ones believe that it's not cool anymore, so they look for something new. So I think that's the natural cycle of social media. Just by virtue of young people don't, not wanting to hang out with older people, there's always got to be a new thing that comes up. Uh, but so far, there is no new thing yet. Uh, TikTok is really it. Let's wait a couple of years. I'm sure there will be another one. Maybe there will be some comeback, like uh, uh, Meta uh, being now a little bit uh, old for uh, young populations. Uh, but um, the Metaverse is the, the new trend. So maybe Facebook will go back in with the Metaverse and maybe TikTok will become uh, obsolete uh, in some years' time. Quite possible, quite possible. I wouldn't put my money on it. I think they've tarnished their brand. If you look at trust surveys in particular, you can see that Facebook consistently scores lowest in terms of consumer trust. Um, so whatever company it will be, it will likely be someone unexpected, a startup, most likely. Okay. okay. Let's see then. Okay. Yes. Une question ici, bonjour, in English or in French? In English, let's go. Hi, good afternoon. Hello. Okay, my name is Dankwa. Nice I'm from you. Accra, Ghana. Thank you for a beautiful presentation. Okay. Thank you for a beautiful presentation. I believe there was no question because it was all clear. But then I was very intrigued at the end, looking at the numbers uh, that you were able to generate for the customers that I saw. So this bring to this, uh, this kind of raise my interest because I want to know how your company can help uh, companies like mine. What do you do to help people you know, with attention data? Okay. Thank you for the question. Yeah, I didn't want to be here to really I sell ourselves. I want it to be useful to the world in this particular case. Um, but we as a company, Datamilk, actually focus on that particular problem. So we help companies collect more information from how users are behaving on their websites and apps and help you utilize that information to make your user experience better. So we're not about analytics. It's great to look at heat maps and such, but really you're looking for the end solution of how can I use someone's behavior to make the next person's experience on the site even better. That's our core focus. And so when we come and work with typically retailers, what we do is we first collect data from their websites and apps. We then train artificial intelligence models to leverage that data, and then we plug it in to nice design features that actually make the user experience of the store work better. And that cycle creates a ton of value, just like it did at Google. 